Michael Shin, when you're out deep canvassing, and if the person were to complain about illegal immigrants being given free stuff at taxpayers' expense, how would you proceed? Well, I'd listen. I mean, that's the first thing you do when you're deep canvassing. And say, you know, I would agree with you if uh, illegal immigrants were being uh, given a lot of free stuff, but illegal immigrants or non-documented immigrants uh, can't get any free stuff at the taxpayer's expense because they're not recognized. They can't go and get that stuff. So I think you're wrong, you know, person I'm talking to, about uh, immigrants getting free stuff at taxpayer's expense. They can't go to government agencies and get help because uh, those agencies are instructed not to give those people help. So, um, and then I, you know, if I had the discussion went on, I'd point out that these undocumented workers work hard. Uh, they do a lot of stuff that uh, people already here in, in the United States will not do. Uh, you know, the dirtiest construction work, uh, you know, the work in the uh, picking the crops, um, a lot of, uh, um, you know, cleaning and uh, home, uh, you know, people that got, what do they call them, nannies, maids, you know, a lot of the uh, people that do that, or um, a lot of them do uh, home, their home health aides, uh, working for agencies that, you know, use undocumented people and then steal their wages. So um, I'd say, you know, these are hardworking people. And, you know, most people in the United States uh, are descended from immigrants. And uh, so, you know, why not uh, let these people do the same thing that the person I'm talking to's forebears probably did? You know, those are the kind of things I would raise. Um, and, and so, yeah, you're gonna have uncomfortable conversations when you're just knocking on people's doors and, you know, coming up with people that have, you know, views you disagree with. Um, and one thing you can always do is, you know, point out where you think they're wrong factually, like the free stuff given by the government to illegal immigrants. But um, facts don't always make a difference because a lot of times that's just an excuse for a prejudice, you know, xenophobic or any Latino or, you know, whatever their the prejudice motivates their anti-immigrant feelings. It's also scapegoating. A lot of people are scapegoating immigrants for problems immigrants didn't cause, like you know, the loss of uh, decent paying factory jobs in this country. Undocumented workers didn't do that. Undocumented workers didn't take those jobs because they, they went overseas. It was big business that moved those jobs away. So there are lots of things you can point out in a give and take in deep canvassing. And, and oftentimes, if you respect the person and don't, you know, denigrate them, but take what they say seriously and try to give them a serious response, they may not agree with you, but they're going to respect the fact that you listen and engage them as a serious person. And politically, a lot of people will end up, end up saying, well, you know, the Green Party, I don't agree with everything they say, but, you know, they come out and talk to us. They listen. Uh, they seem like they're sincere. And I can't say that about the, the other politicians out there. So, hell, I'm going to vote for the Green Party. That's the kind of thing. But the other thing about deep canvassing, and People's Action found this out uh, doing it uh, with uh, white rural, likely Trump voters in Georgia, is that, and there's a lot of, you know, social science research to support this, deep canvassing is the, is the most persuasive form of political persuasion out there, much better than TV advertising or, um, you know, mailing flyers or, um, you know, having house parties and speeches and rallies. Deep canvassing is the most effective thing. And, and when we talk about deep canvassing, maybe I should explain that. That's where you go out and uh, you listen more than you preach. Uh, you, you hear what people are saying and listen to their concerns. And then after a while, you know, you try to relate to them and relate to, you know, your, you know, Green Party platform to their concerns. But the main point is to, you know, go out and listen. Let them get to know you and, and begin to trust you. And it should be done on a constant basis. Uh, it shouldn't just be a one encounter. It should be, you know, you, you go back through the same communities again and again. Um, and then people know the Greens are out there. They want to hear what you have to say. Uh, they have their ideas. And, you know, you may agree or may not. But at least they're taking you seriously, which 
Um, you can't say for the Democrats and Republicans. You know, they just get a lot of money and, and advertise that you when elections come around. Frankie Lee, how, how is ballot access coming for midterms? Will the Greens be on the ballot in most states? How about Texas? Uh, I can't give you a, you know, 51 jurisdiction tally. I know we're on the ballot already on 15 states. That's kind of what we came out of 2020 with. I know they're petitioning in North Carolina to get Matthew Ho on the ballot. Um, that's really important. It's only about, I think they need, I think they need about, yeah, just under 15,000 good signatures, which means 25,000 signatures to be safe. They got to um, sometime in mid or late May. So that's definitely doable, but they need help if you're in the area or in the state. Get out there and get some signatures for them. Uh, I know uh, Missouri's petitioning, New Mexico's petitioning. Uh, I don't know how other states are doing. I can tell you in New York, we got to get 45,000 signatures in 42 days between April 19th and May 31st. That is one of the most difficult petitions, well, the most difficult petition to get on a ballot statewide of any state in the United States. And compared to other countries, it's ridiculous. The U.S. is just uh, terrible compared to other countries. I, I was actually researching um, Russia, you know, how their oblasts, which are like their states, and uh, it's the only country I've found where the petitioning requirements are higher. But what they also have is that if your party's registered, you don't have to petition. You just nominate, which we actually have in New York for statewide offices, um, except president, uh, if you have a ballot line. But that's unusual in the United States. So you can have a convention and nominate. Um, people can still petition to primary you. But anyway, the problem in Russia, though, is getting your party registered because the United Russia party that is Putin's party controls the electoral uh, apparatus. And I've been looking for another country besides the United States where the governing parties administer their own elections. The United States does that. You know, we have bipartisan county boards of elections, although the Republicans are trying to get that change and have got a change in a few states so they can dominate those county boards and the whole election apparatus. Um, there have been some efforts at nonpartisan, but uh, like in Wisconsin, they had it for a while and they repealed it. Um, the Republicans got that repealed. Now they want to get rid of that system for another one that they can control even more. Um, but, you know, the only other country besides Russia where and their boards are controlled proportional to the vote of the uh, previous election. So United Russia, Putin's party gets the most. The Communist Party, which is a pro-Putin party on its you know nationalism and its conservatism, not so much on its austerity for public services. That's where the communists have a little argument with Putin's party. Um, but those two parties dominate. And so they dominate the boards of elections. So if you're a, you know, like the Russian socialist movement, a left-wing eco-socialist party wants to get on a ballot and they get the required signatures and they submit their paperwork. And I, I, in this article I was reading, it was in Nature Magazine of all places, you know, political science, academic article. Um, there's a, a, a mark above the letter. It's kind of like the umlaut in German, but it's another thing, it's in Russian. And this guy uh, on his paperwork uh, had it when it wasn't supposed to be there. So for that reason, they knocked out the whole application for his party. Um, that's the kind of nonsense that heck goes on in Russia. Here it's more subtle. The only other country I found was Ireland, where they, um, you know, had you know uh, party administration of elections. But they're in the process. And when I read this, this is a while ago of getting rid of that and doing like, you know, the rest of Western Europe, Canada, Mexico, you name it, uh, they have independent civil service, nonpartisan election administration. Um, so that's kind of a tangent off ballot access. But, you know, if you have partisan administration of elections, um, you have partisan access to the ballot. I mean, we found that out running for president. We had Three states where we had plenty of signatures to get on a ballot. And uh, those cases went to court. And in every case, 
well, for, or sometimes like in Wisconsin, a, a commission, and then it went to court. And in every case, at the commission level and at the court level, the district court and finally the state Supreme Court, everybody voted party line. They're all hacks. Judges and election commissioners, uh, Republicans wanted us on and Democrats wanted us off. And uh, the facts and the law didn't matter. So that's part of ballot access, too. Uh, we should be pushing for nonpartisan administration of elections by a civil service agency rather than, you know, party hacks that are appointed by the parties.